So uh, let me welcome up Catalina. Catalina Herrera, thank you. One of our solutions engineers uh, out of Texas. And she's gonna talk about ML ops strategies. Sure, I would love for, for that to be trained the same thing. All right, good afternoon. Okay, let's try this again. Good afternoon. Okay, raise your hand if you can hear me, especially the back. There you go, okay, we are awake, or trying to. Okay, so let's talk about MLOps. So first of all, welcome to this session. Today we're gonna to talk about MLOps, that it actually means machine learning operationalization, which actually means what do we do with that thing once we produce it? Which actually means that there is still a lot that is being produced as machine learning and is still sitting on a computer, on a desk, at somebody's office without being out there for anybody else to consume it. So how are we gonna do that? So I will walk you through a machine learning pipeline process I'm gonna be highlighting some pros and cons of uh, what we are seeing in the industry today. Multiple people collaborating on this, so hopefully I'm gonna highlight the key pieces for you to connect dots at the end. And I'm gonna walk you through an end-to-end -end example that is actually connecting all the dots from what we call the data eco governance framework that hopefully at the end of the presentation is gonna clarify why data eco is your platform for removing the friction from those processes. But to remove the friction from those processes, we need to understand what is driving those friction. Okay, so, Aren't we all trying to do the same? Is this looking familiar? Every organization, we are talking about the same thing. We are repeating this. We want better customer experience. We want to improve employee productivity. We want to accelerate innovation. And I will say that for us, I'm gonna say us, considering myself, I am a data scientist, I am an analyst, and I have been growing with this community, and I think a lot of us are coming from that side. We started as an analyst, so we started trying to visualize the descriptive analytics using a BI tool, and then we actually see metrics like increasing process efficiency by 30% or more, or increasing revenue by five to 10% or more. This is not a surprise. These numbers are actually very aligned with what you are seeing already, and that's why we are sitting here today, because we know this can actually drive change. But we still have some issues to go through, and when I say we have some issues to go through, well, there is still a lot of challenges and limitations with this. Why? Simple. Think about the tool that you like to use, and. Everybody here is gonna have somebody, something in mind. Think about how are we actually connecting the artifacts, and I'm gonna be using that word a lot, so what do I mean by an artifact? Well, we're gonna describe a machine learning pipeline as artifacts that are actually doing the whole thing, connecting to data, cleaning the data, creating the machine learning, deploying the machine learning, each of those pieces of the pipeline is gonna be an artifact. Guess what? It's still very hard to connect our people, our processes, and our technology. Why? Why? Well, because we all have different backgrounds, because we all have our different set of skills, because we all like to work with different programming languages or not programming languages or my way to do my thing. And if you look around you, well, guess what? Your way to do your thing is not necessarily exactly the same way of this guy over here that has a completely different goal 
in his or her day because has a completely different set of responsibilities within the company. But then we think about what is a machine learning pipeline, right? So let's talk about those artifacts again, artifacts. So everything has to start from the business understanding, period. Everything else is a waste of time. You have to have a use case to solve, period. That's the beginning of it. OK, what is going to happen next? Well, let's think about a KPI. Everybody has a KPI in their mind? I don't care what, your KPI, the one that you care about. Usually, that KPI is going to have, let's say, a numerator and a denominator. And that numerator is going to have different variables. And the denominator is going to have different variables. OK. Each of those variables is connected to a silo of data. And each of those silos can come from on-prem, on the cloud, silo A, silo B, silo C. Sounds familiar? If I ask you today, where is your data coming from, from your number one KPI, I will have many different answers just for this table here, just from this group. Now imagine that being applied globally across verticals with all kinds of different people generating all of these artifacts. Well, guess what? We are far, like this is just half of it. We are talking about what it takes for us to deploy a model, but to deploy a model, the model needs to exist. And for the model to exist, there is a lot that needs to happen before that. We need to not only understand the use case and the data that is feeding that KPI, but we are also interacting with people, validating, is this making sense? Mr. SME, you are the expert. You are the one who knows about the business. Could you please validate this machine learning stuff? Because garbage in. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. So it makes absolutely no sense for me to be producing machine learning without talking to my team, with my peers, with my experts. Feedback, the business, feedback from the business. So what is going on today is that each of these little heads is using a different technology, because guess what? Some of them are Python lovers. Some of them are R lovers. Do I have any Python lovers? I love Python. Yeah, me too. Be proud. Do we have any R? I did my specialization in R. I loved R. It was my first love. OK. And we have the, hey, I have no clue of programming. OK, exactly. Exactly. So what is going on here? How are we working together when we have to work together? Not that simple. Not that simple. So what are the breaking points here? Hey, we have different people here. We are all are thinking in different ways. And this is going to be very hard to scale, because it's like playing in Spanish, it's um, telefono roto. How do you say that in English? Telefono roto. Broken telephone? <laughs> it is a game where you actually give a secret to somebody, and then you pass the secret to somebody else, and then 15 people more, and then you ask, what was the original thing? And it's like far away from what you originally said. Sounds familiar? OK. That is the friction that we have in this framework. OK? And when we think about one Production, machine learning model, OK, I'm going to keep an eye on this one model. Two, OK, I'm going to keep an eye on these two models. But then what is going to happen? I had one successful use case, and now the business is crazy all over me. And now they want more. And now everything is AI. And now everything is machine learning. And now it's like, OK, guys, how are we going to scale, right? How are we going to grow? How are we going to think about 100? How are we going to think about 1,000? How are we going to tech communicate? And how are we going to reuse the artifacts that are being created by A, B, C, D, which is, has completely set of skills? So you love Python, you love R, I don't care, but I still want to ask questions to my data. I may come from an analytic background, I used Power BI and Tableau, and I am ready to move on into a descriptive analytics and not only stay in the, uh, in the into a predictive analytics and not only stay in the descriptive analytics. So, have you Google MLOps? What happens if you Google MLOps? 
What is the commonality here? The feedback, the loop, the feedback, the loop. Why? Because first of all, one machine learning is not going to be precise forever. Second of all, you're going to have new data that is going to be affecting that machine learning. And what if that model starts drifting? How will you know? How do you know that the machine learning that you are creating is actually doing what you think it's doing? Like, the one consistency here is that loop. And you do need to have feedback. And you do need to include your SMEs as part of that feedback. And you do need to include your extended team with extended set of skills, backgrounds, and expertise as part of that loop, OK? So what is Data IQ doing, right? This is the orchestration that needs to happen with a future-proof glue that the left side, and we have been saying this all morning, right? This is going to continue to change. Your infrastructure is today one way, tomorrow another way. In a year, you may have a cloud strategy. In another year, you may have a hybrid cloud strategy. And you still have a couple of SQLs on-prem. Why not? And who else? What, and what else? Who knows? So whatever you do will have to be resilient to that change because that is going to continue to happen. So how are we going to scale if we have to start from zero every time that we do a change on the infrastructure? How are we going to scale if we are not able to reuse what my people is generating with the set of skills that they have today? OK? So the right side of the slide is a lot of us coming from the analytics side of the spectrum which is we learned Power BI, Tableau, we know how to visualize this use case, we know how to describe this use case and use my descriptive analytics to component, but now I want to push it to the predictive side. And for that to happen, again, all the artifacts, what are the artifacts? Artifact one, connect to the 15 silos that I have. Artifact two, Clean that data, concatenate it, join it. Artifact three, experiment with machine learning. Model A, model B, model C. Artifact four, hey, who is going to be consuming this how? Who is going to be asking questions to this machine learning model? What is her or his role? What kind of user interface is going to be able to manage that or that demand for the extended team? So everything that happens in between, it's going to be an artifact that is going to happen in one way or another. Doesn't matter. How is it going to look in Data IQ? Orange bubble or yellow bubble? Who cares? Bubble at, at the end. I can actually reuse it. So embrace open source. I love open source. I love not reinventing the wheel. Use all the packages. Use all the libraries. Don't start from zero. But let's make it consumable, let's make it reusable, let's make it transparent, let's make it understandable, and let's make it part of a framework that has an end-to-end. -end. So DataQ's framework is going to highlight four main stages that we believe are part of the regular pipelines, OK? Stage number one, aren't we all very familiar with that? Prepare. That is where we are still going in circles like a hamster in a wheel. Let's prepare again and then change the data source and then let's prepare again. And how we are preparing this? Well, this person knew Python and now he is gone and none of that is documented. And now we have to start all over and good luck with us scaling, right? So the prepare aspect of it. It's still 80, 85% of the time where we are so evolved in terms of the technology and what we can be doing with this. So what is going to happen next? Build. So I already discovered the data. Remember, use case first. What is that I'm trying to solve first? Then, OK, silo A, silo B, silo C. I did my cleaning. I understand the data. I created a Power BI dashboard. I have a very good analy a descriptive analytics use case. 
Everybody's happy, understand it. Okay, let's push it to predictive. What we can do here, okay? Who is doing predictive? Well, I have these data scientists that are super Python lovers, but I am also having this group of people that went to school and remember the y equal mx plus b, and guess what? Not every machine learning model has to be deep learning neural network, no. We do have simpler cases, way simpler cases, that we can still maximize the opportunity into, right? So the building of the model can be Python, pure Python, bring it on, orange bubble, or it can be AutoML capabilities with transparency. It's not only, hey, this is your model, but hey, this is your model, and these are all the tests that we did this is how we are validating this model, and this is the transparency that I now I can have through that model. So AutoML becomes just another artifact that I can use as part of my pipeline. Now, now what? A lot of us are still here. A lot of us are still in the first half of this framework. That is just the beginning. Now what do we do with that? Who is gonna be using that? Who is gonna be asking questions to it? How? What is the user interface that I'm going to have? OK. Deploy. No, deploy to production. I'm going to have a completely different set of problems there. I need to ensure that I am using the most uh, updated version of the model. I need to have very different perspective from this side, right? I'm thinking about different things. And yet, how do I know that thing is doing what I think is doing? How am I going to keep an eye on that model? Do I have a drift happening? Do I need to notify somebody because I have a drift happening? What if the person who trained the model originally, guess what, is no longer with the company? And guess what, there is zero documentation about it. And now I have to retrain that and redeploy it. How am I going to assemble all of those pieces together if the teams cannot tech communicate? We need to be able to tech communicate. So the artifacts that we build one way or another have to be reusable and need to talk to each other, okay? That needs to be there. So stage one, two people, business SME, data engineer, different questions, different things crossing their mind. Hey, I need to ensure that we are qualifying this, and that is actually aligned with the expectations. We have to define the business use case, again, and how this is part of a bigger business initiative, right? We start with the business use case. Then we may have a data engineer that, hey, you know what? I have a completely different problem. I actually struggle to help the team rely on better data, and I need to ensure that these guys have the best possible data to move on. Okay. Wow, data science is a team sport. Analytics is a team sport. Now I have completely different personas wondering different things. This guy is asking, hey, is this model robust, secured, approved? By whom? Like if I have a bad outcome as a result of machine learning, who is responsible for it? Anybody? Is this aligned with the politics that we have inside the company? <laughs> Do we have any? Right? That's the question that you have to be asking. Now, the fact that we can actually one-click deploy this, what it means is these guys are going to be thinking completely different things. Is this the proper model version? Is this being reviewed? Do I have an approval from the business for this model to be deployed into production? Uh, do I have a self-service with the deployer? Like how, how? I'm going to serve this to an extended team that is going to be consuming it somehow, right? So how are we going to connect the dots? And we mentioned briefly the fact that we have the Gover node that is, for me, is the cherry on top of the ice cream that actually connects every single point and closes the framework in the most beautiful way. Why? Because all the artifacts talk to each other, because they are integrated regardless of who produced them and how they were produced. They are part of a bigger picture. They are part of the data science pipeline. And now I can actually ask 
different questions. I am going to be serving this in a way that somebody can do something with it. And I'm going to actually alert somebody if I have a drift, if my A-B test failed, if you define your alarm, you define your threshold, you define your guardrails for all the artifacts that are being assembled by very diverse team with very diverse structure, right? So let's check it out. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to connect the dots, how this look like in an actual user interface. So for that, let's imagine we have a credit card fraud, classic use case. We are going to detect fraud. We train the model with, whole, with baseline historical data. We had some true positives. We had a very decent model, good, good metrics, good precision. And then we're going to think about different people. So different people is like, again, think about your team and think about who is governing that, who should be governing that, what are the questions that they are asking themselves. And just notice that they do have different objectives and they do have different pains. They have different OKRs, OK? That's the main goal here. So what is going to happen is that I'm going to have the guys build this machine learning pipeline, and I'm going to start with an alert. Hey, drift is happening. So the business user received the alert that is drift happening, and immediately can go to the pipeline and check it out, like, OK, first of all, I have the entire history of what happened to this data. I can actually check out the model. I can review the what-if scenario. I can know exactly what is the model doing. And I actually see that this is increasing. And this is bad because this is missed frauds. And this is because the model is drifting, meaning my model is not as accurate anymore. This is costing me money. This is costing me money. So now I have a different persona. By the way, I got an alert this morning, and I noticed that this model is drifting. I'm going to check it out. Oh, yeah, I see the drift. And this model is in production. Let's check out what business initiative this model belongs to. Who are the sponsors? What is the stage of the initiative? In general, what is the business overview? Ah, oh yeah, I have the previous data scientist is no longer with the company. Doesn't matter. I embedded the documentation that you need, and I embedded pretty much everything is contained in this governable item, and I can see exactly who is responsible for what and who is creating what within it. And it's kind of a stock. So I can actually open the uh, data coup model documentation that was created automatically. And now I'm going to send that to a data scientist, a new data scientist, no previous experience in the company, no idea what the previous data scientist did, but I got the link to the actual flow. So I can see exactly what's going on here. It is a delay. I can see exactly what's going on here, and I can see, hey, is this actually going down? How many versions of that model do I have? How it was produced? Who cares? Was it coming from MLflow? Was a pickle file? Bring it on. But let's add this layer of transparency to it. So now I can actually check the drift of that model. Oh, yeah, 0.88. That's a serious drift. What is causing that drift? Well, we have new data. And with the new data, we have people that is actually with a different age and that is causing a bimodality on that variable. And that bimodality on that variable is causing a drift. Summary, simple, we have new data. The model needs to be updated, period, right? So now we know exactly which variables are being considered in that model and which ones are actually driving that drift. So I can easily have the understanding of the behind the scenes of the model. I have the transparency into it. I have everything that I need to have 
to share that with my users, with my business stakeholders, with the approvers that actually are going to put their name there and say, yes, this model can be redeployed, right? So we have a new version of the model. Now we understand exactly how is causing that by modality, where is the data coming from, what is the new active version. So now we have, hey, model one versus model two versus model three. Some of these models were created in one way or another. Some of the models were even created outside. It doesn't matter. We bring it and we make it part of that transparency box, right? So here you have the explainability of the model. You have everything that you need to know from the performance perspective. You can share this with a business user. You can share this with an SME. That SME is going to understand what is changing or why the model needs to be retrained. And I will have to redeploy it. But to redeploy the model, I will need somebody to authorize it, right? So the govern node that we have been showing during the morning today is connecting all of the pieces, understands that this is the new active version that we want, so we want to redeploy it. One click of the mouse, bundle it, deploy it, which is pretty much connect this to the production infrastructure, let it be up to date, let me share this with an extended team now that I have the new version of the model. But as soon as I click OK, I will need an authorization from somebody. Why? Because somebody else cares about this. And that was the person that received the alert message this morning. And she's going to prove it because we already talked. I show her everything. She knows the explainability of the model. She knows why that is the version that should be deployed. And now, again, I have all the pieces, including the new version of the model, all the people that is involved, and the final approvals. Right? So we are connecting the dots. We are closing that loop. We are using the framework with all the components, with all the pieces that we have. And that highlights how we see ML ops. So machine learning, operationalization is a team sport. You are going to have different people collaborating in different ways. Your goal is to be able to scale. Therefore, you need to be able to reuse stuff. Right? You can't start from zero every time that somebody is new in the team. That is not agile. That is not going to allow you to scale. So the four main components here, prepare, build, deploy, monitor, every single persona having different goals, having different skills, but connecting all the goals together. So we mentioned at the beginning, we need to connect our people our technology, and our processes. And we need to have a future-proof orchestration that is going to be up to date. It doesn't matter the changes that you do on the left side. You will maintain that glue because you are reusing the assets that are being created in one way or another. You are using your team's skills as they are today. You are not hoping to find a phenomenal data scientist in three months but you can actually start reusing these assets today. And last comment, we have been really closing these, like the last two revisions are very oriented into this framework and more and more new features that are helping all the four categories, covering the four personas, covering their own pains and daily tasks and goals. Thank you. I appreciate your time.